Okay, we are going to uh, continue with uh, Dr. Stephanie Kruger. Uh, especially, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Kruger for joining us today. She has a great experience uh, about uh, consultancy and uh, I admire uh, her academic background. Uh, now it's your turn, uh, Stephanie. Uh, microphone is your, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation to be here today. I'm very happy in particular to see all the students joining us. And I'll be talking about information resources in a way that's maybe a little bit different from some of the document delivery related specific topics, although we'll talk about ILL briefly in one of the case studies. And I was asked today to kind of introduce you to how academics actually are using information resources and tools, as you see in the title. And I wanted to introduce myself by saying I have a unique perspective on this because I work not only in a library, but I also work for two universities as a professor at the same time. So I think this provides me with a, a different kind of career path, um, but I wanted also to show you that your career in information and library studies can lead in many different directions. So it's a really wonderful pro uh, profession and I hope that uh, I provide you with a different way of looking at the information universe. So I'll go through three case studies today. Um, you'll see the, those in a moment. Um, we'll spend the majority of our 30 minutes on those three case studies. Um, they're actual people that I work with, but I've uh, made them anonymous for the purposes of this presentation. And just for logistic purposes, because there are so many of us here today, I just ask that you hold on questions until the last 10 minutes. I'll be sure to leave enough time for questions, um, but this is mostly lecture until then. And at that point, we'll have a chance to chat and talk and answer questions. And I provided my email. So if you have questions that I don't cover in class, I'll be happy to answer those questions directly with you via email. No problem at all. Uh, we can continue the discussion after today. So the three cases um, I'm going to be talking about are, as I mentioned, three actual people. Um, one is a final year PhD candidate. The other is a postdoctoral researcher. And the final one is an established researcher. I'm not sure if you've done an internship in the academic library before. Um, so I hope that when you, if you do do an internship in the future, if you've only had theoretical coursework, I hope that making, putting a face to these people will make it easier for you to think about user-based service design. It's something that I believe is very important in libraries. I think oftentimes we get so close to the institutions that we're working in, to the day-to-day -day tasks. When you're in library school, learning how to catalog things, learning about web uh, design, all of that, that sometimes I believe we forget about the real people that we're serving and what their actual needs are. And their needs are maybe surprising and Sometimes we don't think about them every day, but um, I think it's important, even if you don't interact with this level of people yet, if you mostly interact with bachelor students or master students, I feel it's important to think about these people because they might pop up at the service desk or at the virtual reference desk if you're serving patrons directly. So my first case, uh, uh, her name is Silvana, uh, not really Silvana, but uh, that's the name I provided for her. Uh, you can see here, she's an international student in Prague. She's in the final year of her doctoral studies and she's still undecided if she wants to be a professor in a university or if she actually wants to work for a corporation. And since I 
put this proposal together, she's actually, after she completes an internship in another country, not where her she's actually doing her PhD studies, she's going to do an internship at a corporation. And she hopes that that will give her experience that in the future will help her make the decision, do I stay in academia or do I take a corporate path? And her life needs regarding information and also not information are, as you see here, she's thinking about what she needs to do to get her PhD done. So we'll go through in detail what the kinds of things she needs to know for that, what she needs from the library and so on. Um, but those things can include state exams and her PhD dissertation. Our second case is Milan. Uh, he's a postdoctoral researcher. He did his PhD at one university and then went and did a postdoctoral research position in two countries and then came back to his home institution. He also is not yet a full-time professor, is not working full-time for a university, but is working on contract positions. What this means is that he's at the point in his life where he needs to decide finally if he will stay in academia or if he will um, go outside. And if he stays in academia, he's an engineer, he needs to bring grant money into the mix. So he actually has to find money at the institution he's at to become a principal investigator. Um, so this is, we'll get to that in a moment. It's a really big step for him. And he needs information in this regard and information that we as libraries can provide to him. And finally, we have an established researcher. She is actually working at a university, has now done this for many years and has tenure, which means she can't really get fired easily from her job. She's an author, in addition to being a researcher, she publishes a lot. And where she needs a lot of support uh, from the library is in keeping her aware of trends uh, so that, and helping her students and the people she's mentoring so that she can have more time for her actual research and for mentoring students when they actually need help. We'll go into more detail about all three of these cases in a moment. Regardless of these people, uh, you may as a master's student, I know many of you are master's students here today, um, think that the people doing a doctorate or who are researchers know a lot about searching information. But in my work with the doctoral candidates and above, I often find that even the advanced researchers overestimate their research and searching abilities. A lot of people, because of the online environment, because of social media, think they know how to search. They think they're finding appropriate information but oftentimes they are blind in many ways. And they don't know, for example, even established researchers that the library exists, that online resources exists. And it's our job as librarians to make them aware of the availability of our resources, in my opinion. And you can see here, we really need to fill a lot of gaps that they think they know about but they don't. And that oftentimes in the real world means proactively reaching out to researchers, to doctoral students and figuring out creative new ways to reach them, to let them know what the library offers and how we can help them. It's not just about promotion and marketing, but it's more about integrating ourselves into the teaching and learning process, in my opinion. And don't be worried if you work for an academic library after you complete your degree. If you have a master's and you're working with people at the PhD plus level, I think that's okay um, in working with students. But if you have a master's in another field or do a doctorate during the course of your life, I think it can be really helpful in working with these folks. But again, I don't think it's necessary, but it provides you with a different perspective particularly in terms of understanding scholarly publishing, understanding how scholarly journals work, how research methods work, and so on. We don't have time to go into depth about that today, but I'll show you in a few minutes 
a few places where you can learn more about that kind of thing. So a little bit more detail about each case. Uh, if we go back to Silvana, the doctoral candidate, I wanted to map her needs uh, in her life back to information and what kinds of information she requires. And that means places the library can help her. And I have provided some tables after this slide that we'll go through where I'll briefly highlight some of these things. So regarding information, what she really needs at this point in her life is assistance with refining her research topic and making her research methodology good enough to publish her PhD dissertation. Uh, you can see here her, her mentor, and in this case, real life mentor, has helped her a little bit, but in the end, she has to come up with this. And she's not a native English speaker, so she has to come up with English keywords for searching. She has to read a lot of articles in English. So just like you, English is a second language for her, and this is not an easy task. And the library can be helpful there, as we'll see in a moment. All of this feeds into the writing of her PhD thesis. She also helps her mentor with research and teaching. So all of her searching skills that she is learning in the course of her doctorate are directly applicable to the tasks her mentor assigns to her. And she also has to add new skills that she didn't have to do as a master's student in her case, which is helping with teaching bachelor and master students. She also has to learn new things regarded, regarding data, such as creating charts and graphs and learning more about research methods. She also assists her mentor in writing grant proposals, so proposals for money for further research. And she had to, as part of her PhD studies, write her first article. So she had to learn about more about what scholarly journals are than a master's student. And she also has to learn about what is peer review and the whole scholarly publishing process. Plus, during the course of her studies, she's had to participate in conferences, which, as you all know, during the past two years were mostly virtual, which present problems of their own. So in this diagram, and I know we don't have time to go through it in, uh, in detail today, so I'll just highlight a few things. And then I encourage you to go and read and look at all the links after this session um, to find out more about the things I mentioned. So in her case, this is even more detail. This table shows you she's for each key task, which you see on the left-hand side, I've provided you with what the library can offer her, what subscription resources offer to her, what open resources offer to her, and basically what are the information needs she has. And I wanna to stress to you that this is really hard today because of the mixture of subscription resources offered by the library and open resources that are sometimes offered by libraries, but not always. And this creates a lot of confusion for people that we're working with. So you as an information professional, you need to, understand that this is a hybrid environment and that you need to know not only about the academic resources, the things the library provides, but you also have to keep aware of new trends and new things that are made open and available. And most important for you to remember about this slide is when you're a non-native English speaker is I think that I would encourage you one thing that can help you and that may, you've maybe learned in coursework, but it's hard, is you have to actually, in the course of your studies and working with these people, really learn to search well in English and to formulate English keyword phase, phrases, to do advanced searches in English. And this isn't always easy, um, but I encourage you to really start working on those skills early. And one way you can do it is by going to library resources and learning more about them. So if your library offers subscription databases and tools, go into those tools, read about them, read the help 
read the help information, learn about how each discipline has, uh, for example, reaccess the chemistry database that your university may or may not have access to, um, but learn about how it all works. Listen to your professors and go from there. And regarding uh, this side of the equation, also learn about open specialized tools. Uh, there are, for example, in the sciences, many open tools to learn about, and you can learn about them by even interviewing people that you're working with, asking researchers about what you can do to learn more about their information needs. Um, but that's maybe kind of advanced for your state. But my point is, this is a lifelong learning process. <laughs> All right, and to go to specific library skills on this chart, um, searching skills in English, again, I'd like to repeat, if you can find out about the courses that are offered for PhD students on your campus or your university, if you're working in a universe, university library, go look at the syllabus, attend some classes and see what people are doing in this area. And one thing we do at the Czech National Library of Technology where we know the library can help a lot is in teaching people how to cite properly, what is plagiarism, how to format references. And we find that this is a problem with high school students, bachelor students, master students, and everyone. So the more instruction you can give people and the more you can learn yourself about citing, referencing, and ethics related issues and things like that, the better. And also, I just wanted to mention some of the universities have university repository requirements. Sometimes libraries offer a service regarded to this, and sometimes they don't. So if you end up with a job in a library and are serving doctoral students, find out what the situation is at your library. And then other key tasks, research and teaching writing proposals and articles and writing conference abstracts and presenting at conferences, you see there's a lot of writing there. Where the library comes in and the information skills, again, searching skills, reading skills, and guiding people to the appropriate resources. So it's not just about searching and learning what scholarly literature is and so on, but it's also guiding people to pre-existing resources that exist. For example, in teaching now, there are many open educational resources. So learning what those kind of things are, what is offered, for example, in medicine. And uh, there are many, many changes in this area, rapid changes because of COVID and the transition to distance learning. So there's a lot going on here, but the library, off also has a role. And you'll see here, one of the bigger roles in teaching, for example, is the provision of textbooks, course reserves, and other electronic teaching aids. All right. And so, and one thing here I wanted to highlight with you as well um, is that, and I know that most of you are not native English speakers, uh, we find with our PhD researchers, they often are looking to improve their writing and they're using AI writing tools. Maybe you do this yourself, Google Translate and Grammar Tools. These are good, but if you look over on the other column here, they don't help people formulate their ideas. And one of the biggest issues that we see in many of our doctoral students, for example, and even postdoctoral researchers is their ability to concentrate. So one thing that we're doing is providing resources to people, links to resources, not instructing them ourselves about how to concentrate better, how to spend 10 minutes writing instead of looking at social media. This is hard for a lot of people nowadays. Okay. So again, we have such a short time today, just some highlights here. Uh, the hybrid environment is the mixture of both library resources and open resources. Sci-Hub and similar article retrieval tools are not enough at the PhD plus level. So the library subscription resources become more important to doctoral candidates than they did before. 
The value of subscription resources that the library provides is, in my opinion, the ability to browse and discover uh, on a research, um, research topics at the interdisciplinary level. And many researchers you'll find they know about one database, like they know about IEEE, but they don't understand that there are other disciplines working on the same area. So if they're not using a library search engine, they miss about developments in other fields. Regarding ILL and resource sharing, um, one thing with PhD students that we often help with uh, in Prague is helping people find dissertations so that they can see models for their work. And they often don't realize that there are so there's a subscription database to help them with this. ProQuest dissertations, but if your library doesn't have access to that, they don't know they can go to interlibrary loan. And so I think it's really important um, when it comes to dissertations for the PhD students to know about ILL services. And one thing they might even be able to do is email authors directly um, to ask them if they're willing to share the dissertation because some people are really shy about copyright issues. And I know that uh, many librarians are afraid to share full dissertations and only are worried about chapters and sections of those, but oftentimes the authors are willing to share more. And I think it's important to kind of reach out and try uh, to reach original authors if there's something that's not available to our patrons. And um, one thing here is the I want to challenge you to think about what with all of this, what is library service? And although as library professionals, we're focusing on information searching tasks, perhaps we can work with other units at our uh, institution to support information needs that blur into other areas, such as writing, career planning, and counseling. And one way to do that is to offer these services in a different place, uh, a space either on the library webpage or have people come to the library. And also there's a resource STEM skiller that's linked to from the tables and I'll include a link at the end that I think would be very useful to people. All right, and then a case, the final two cases, and then uh, we already will need to get onto questions. The postdoctoral researchers are actually very similar to doctoral students, but what they're doing is even more. So they're writing more articles, doing more research, and then becoming more visible online. Um, so they need more things involved in scholarly communications, such as researcher IDs, things like ORCID, the Scopus researcher ID, a Google Scholar profile, and so on. This session, we don't have time for that, but go and Google research what those things are if you don't know about them. Um, the library can be helpful there, um, but we don't have time for that today. But what I wanted to say is where can we be super helpful is helping them learn about where to publish and journal quality. Uh, we get a lot of people coming to us that get confused by predatory journals that you may have heard about in some classes and using Web of Science, Scopus, Beals List, things like this can be very helpful uh, in answering those questions. And at this level, I think the library can be very helpful in gaining access to specialized expensive books. I find that people come to me desperate. They don't think of the library at this postdoctoral researcher level. And they're like, hey, I couldn't find this on Sci-Hub. Okay, you couldn't find it on Sci-Hub. You couldn't find a, find a free PDF. Let's buy this for you. So the library becomes that fast purchasing resource. And a lot of people just don't think the library can do that for them. So I think this is a service that we can really provide. And it's not related to resources, but I think we can create spaces for these people where they can concentrate better. And we did this at the Czech National Library of Technology in Prague. And I would encourage you to think creatively about space as well. Finally, in addition to all of the things we've been talking about with the library, uh, the tenured professors, in addition to everything, uh, that whole table that I showed you for uh, doctoral students, they have all of these other responsibilities. So these people start to get overwhelmed. And during COVID times, I found a lot of professors struggling to even keep up with everything because they were balancing working from home, 
their families, conducting their research. And um, it was very difficult to balance things for them because everything happened in a different way. And the transition to online happened very quickly. So one thing they needed us in the library for in Prague was to help them quickly get teaching resources, to find open educational resources, to support them in the online learning environment. And many of them in Prague had been used to only teaching in the classroom. And we found ourselves in the library helping them make the digital transition. Again, this is a question of where library service ends and more broader support begins. And every institution has a different way of handling that. But where the library I feel can be helpful again is in helping with this digital transition while getting access to hard to find textbooks, helping people with digital teaching uh, resources and getting specialized assistance and proactively helping the researchers. So if something new is available, doing something like setting up a newsletter to let people know what's happening because people are a little overwhelmed. And also one thing we, that relates a little bit to Donald's in a way of what is legal, what is not, I find that a lot of my researchers, they wanna publish articles, but they need help with the license um, that they're negotiating with their publisher or platform. What that means is they need help understanding their rights as a copyright holder, as an author. They need to decide if something they write can be open access, if it should be gated access, if they can put it on ResearchGate, if they can make it openly available, put it on their own website. If, for example, can they show a video in the classroom? Those kind of legal issues uh, are something that the library field can help people with. Okay, that went really quickly. <laughs> so at this point, um, I wanted to have time for discussion and I wanted to open things up. I will stop sharing. I also wanted to tell you, I include in the slides, a tool that we created at the Czech National Library of Technology to help students at the PhD plus level, as well as their mentors. And this link is provided here, and it includes a lot of information uh, that you can look at. Uh, and I think that might even help you in your own studies if you have to write a dissertation, for example, and a, a master's thesis and are struggling with that. Um, pretty much everything's there for your disposal. Um, so I will stop sharing and open it up for questions, discussion, and Thank ideas. you, Stephanie. Thank you for your presentation. It, uh, there were several details in your slides and it was looking like a real uh, mentor uh, presentation. Thank yes. you for sharing all details with us. Also, we are going to uh, conduct your survey for now when we are uh, talking about uh, your questions and uh, exp your explanations. Ramazan, can you please uh, conduct the survey? Yes, here it is. Uh, this will be on screen uh, about two minutes. You can submit your answers in two minutes. Then we are going to analyze with Stefania. And also I'm going to check chat box. Is there any uh, question to you, Stefani? Yes. You can also uh, ask your questions. Yes, there is a question from uh, Alena. Please go ahead, Alena. Yeah, thank you, Eto. I have one question for you, Stefani, because it happened to me time to time if I'm helping students, especially PhD students that have very specific topic. And sometimes at the beginning, it's hard to find something because very, very usually they also do not know the terminology yet. They have the topic, abstract, and that's all. And at the beginning, it usually takes me some time together with the student to find the proper keyword. And it can be, it can feel weird because you are supposed to be the expert that know how to find, but what are your tips and tricks for this part, the beginning of, of working with users on the queries? <laughs> yes, 
what I uh, try to do is it, it sometimes it's not possible if you're at a reference desk and have to do it really quickly. I think that's the most difficult situation. But what I try to do is have the students actually write down nowadays, if I'm working with them in person, write down the list of keywords that they're working on, or if I'm scheduling a virtual interaction with them, it's helpful to schedule in advance, um, have them provide a few of the things on their topic already um, by email. Uh, usually I don't use chat. I try to keep it asynchronous so that I have more time to think about those things. And I, what I like to do is go and do this, put myself in their shoes. I take their keywords and I go and conduct intensive searches and read a few articles from their field. So that I, and then I use some of the articles that I find with the abstract and the keywords there to think about the topic a little bit more. Then I take those keywords that I discover and I plug them in to advanced resources. And if I'm not sure about the discipline, if it's you know something I don't know a lot about, I actually go back and look at the list of resources that the library provides and I learn about the resources again. And then I make a list of databases that is helpful. And let me just show you at NTK this list um, for those of you who don't know what something like that looks like. Can you see this library page here? Uh, you're now, yes. Okay. Yes. So our library has a list of all e-resources. And what I do is I actually go and refresh my memory because everyone struggles with this. There are so many different databases and tools. So I actually, each and every time, it's my homework, I go and look through the resources and I read a description. <laughs> and then I go and look at the resource and I go and look at advanced searching options and I test keywords and specialized searches in the database. If your library doesn't have access to a lot of resources, one, one thing you can do uh, is look up uh, different specialized databases. And of course, if your library doesn't have a, a search engine that is functioning well, I often do, do a Google Scholar search. Um, like, let's say I was working with a, a student this morning on this topic. <laughs> you can see um, I went in and I scanned the literature. Uh, if your library has links to Google Scholar, this is a very helpful thing to do. Our library uh, does this and I find it very help helpful. And I, you know, Google Scholar is what it is, but you can also look at some of the open resources if full text isn't available to you. And for example, this one, <laughs> let's pick one, uh, go and scan the PDF. Oh, this is too big for today. I go and look at whatever that is. And one thing I do, I also look for recent stuff because the professors often assign recent topics to their students because they wanna learn more about it. Um, so I go and kinda, whatever I find, yeah, presentations are helpful too. I kinda learn what are they talking about? <laughs> you don't have to be an expert at this. Um, but you do have to understand um, at least what the topic's about. But so I supplement library resources with open resources. I learn about the field. I test keywords, and then I make a map for the student. Mm -hmm. And I say, "Is this what you're looking for?" So I scheduled another consultation with the student, and we reach a consensus. And uh, is this what I, what you're understanding? Is this what I'm understanding? Uh -huh. And then we move forward. And at that point, I often show the students how to search. Uh -huh. So that process that I just showed you, uh -huh. Uh -huh. I repeat with the students. Uh -huh. Because if a student is overestimating their abilities, they're often shy to show you they don't know about the library resources. And so it's helpful to show them because they can sit and be silent without being embarrassed that they don't know about the library. Because I think a lot of the times we work with them and they, they say, yes, yes, I know about the library. <laughs> However, 
they don't, <laughs> which becomes apparent later on. So I, I, I do kind of those demonstrations so that they feel comfortable, not shy, and they learn how to, they've seen me working with those resources. And then of course, like today in our really brief presentation, uh, I see everyone was listening. Thank you. <laughs> That's the hardest question. <laughs> Stephanie, here is the survey results. If there is no more question to you, so, you can analyze the uh, survey results. Yeah, so I thought, so thanks everyone. You did a great job, just like in Donald's presentation. And I see you understood the difference between library resources and open resources, which was the main point. And just, yeah, regarding that, the hybrid environment for the period you'll be having your careers, as I mentioned, it's lifelong learning. So it's something you'll be learning about for the rest of your life as a librarian. <laughs> and I find that fun. So don't get dismayed by that. Um, I personally find that a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, I'm looking uh, chat box. Uh, to see, is there any uh, question to you? There are some uh, thank messages to you, uh, Stefani, on the check box. Uh, it seems that there is no more question. I know. Yes, and oh. it's Friday afternoon in Turkish <laughs> time, so. <laughs> yes, it is. Also, uh, also, it was very nice to me to see uh, many colleagues from Antiki, like Alena. Uh, I'm so happy to see you all here. And uh, I think it's now the time to finish the session. Uh, I, uh, I, want, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my special thanks go to Stephanie and uh, Donald for their uh, valuable presentations. Uh, they were both very uh, impressive for all of us. Uh, and thank you for your time. Hope to see you in our next session. Have yes. a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. Nice meeting you all. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>